Hi and welcome to the fifth part in a series of videos on PF Sense. In this video we're going to go through DHCP, static mappings, interfaces and configuring an access point for Wi-Fi amongst other things. So let's get started. So at the end of the last video we finished off with looking at backup and restore. So what we're going to look at next is the DHCP server. So for that we need to click onto services and you'll find it here. And the first thing you'll see is whether to have the DHCP server enabled or disabled. And obviously we're going to want to have that enabled. Okay so if we scroll down the page a little bit we can see here the subnet. This is the subnet which the IP address range is in. And for me it's 10.10.20.0. And the available range of IP addresses which can be given out by this DHCP server range from 1 up to 254. Now you may be tempted just to think, well I'm going to use all of the IP addresses that I can. But the problem with doing this is if you want to have the DHCP server give out specific IP addresses to various computers on your network, then you're going to have to use DHCP static mappings. And we can only assign static mappings for IP addresses which are not in any DHCP pool. So with that in mind, I'm going to change my DHCP range to 10.10.20.100 to 10.10.20.180. And I'm going to click Save. Okay, so now we've set up our DHCP pool, let's do some IP address reservations for certain clients on our network. Now to do that, We'd scroll to the bottom of the page and you can see here the DHCP static mappings for this interface. And we can click onto the button here called Add. Now we need to put the MAC address at the top here and we can just click Copy My MAC and that will put in the MAC address of the computer that you're accessing this web UI with. But to easily be able to put in other MAC addresses from existing clients on your network, if you click onto Status and then go to DHCP Leases, we can see here the various clients that are on this subnet. So this one here, the Xbox One, let's set a static mapping for that. So we want to click onto the first plus symbol here, and that's put the MAC address into the box for us. Now we want to leave the client identifier empty, and then put in the IP address which we want to be assigned to the device. And the host name's already been filled out for us. And if it doesn't already have one, then you can put one in here. And you can fill in the description and then scroll down to the bottom of the page and click Save. And then apply the changes. Now, if we go back and look at our DHCP leases, we can see here, here's the static mapping that we just put in. However, we can also see that the Xbox One has still got its IP address assigned from when it got its lease earlier on from when it was first started up. And that's because we need to reboot the Xbox One and then it will be given a new DHCP lease. So I'll go ahead and reboot the Xbox then refresh this page and look at the DHCP leases. Okay so now with the Xbox One restarted it's only listed once in the DHCP leases and it's got the static IP address of 10.10.20.50. And so now this IP address is reserved only for the use of the Xbox One and it can't be given out to any other clients even if the console's not turned on, so therefore ensuring that this device will always have the same IP address. Okay, so that's how we give the same IP address to a device each time, but we can also use static mappings to give an IP address to a device within a certain range. Let's take this device here called Bumblebee. Let's click on Add Static Mapping, and here the MAC address has been put in. I'm going to copy this because we're going to need this in a moment. Now this time I'm going to leave this IP field blank and you can see here it says if no IP4 address is given then one will be dynamically allocated from the pool. So let's click on to save and then apply changes. Now let's scroll down and we're going to add an additional pool of IP addresses. And so I'm going to give this pool a description and just call it second pool. Now we just have to give it a different range from the first pool. and then click save. And we can see the second pool added in here. So now what we're going to do is we're going to scroll down the page here and we're going to go to MAC address control and click on display advanced and then for MAC address deny I'm going to paste the MAC address of the computer that we mapped just a moment ago 
and click save. So what this has done is for the first pool here, this device will be denied access to an IP from that pool. So that will force it into the second pool, then getting an IP address from this range here from the 10.10.20.230 to 240. So let's go back to our DHCP leases and I'm going to restart this device. So now let's refresh the page. Now we can see at the bottom here, for this static mapping, it's not got an IP address here as this isn't a static IP address. But we can see at the top here now that it's been given the first IP address in this second pool. So now Bumblebee has got the IP address of 10.10.20.230. And yeah, I know this isn't something most people would want or need to do, having a second pool with certain devices pushed into it. But maybe there could be a use case whereby the second IP pool would have a different set of firewall rules applied to it. But probably a more likely use case of having two IP pools would be maybe you've already got a network set up and some of your devices already have statically assigned IP addresses. For example in the range from x.x.x.30 .x .x to x.x.x.50. And so this way you might want to set the first pool to run from 10 to 29 and then the second pool to run from 51 to 99. Then that way the range where your static IPs are on your existing LAN are not going to be included in the pool. So another thing we can use static mappings for was if we had checked this box here, the deny unknown clients, this would mean with this checked, only the devices listed here would be able to get an IP address. And one thing to notice is we have this setting in each IP pool. So in the second pool as well, we've got this option as well as the first. Okay, so we've seen how the DHCP server can give our IP addresses in different pools, but it can also give out different IP addresses in different subnets. Now at the moment I've only got the one here, the LAN, but if I was to go to interfaces and then assignments, I can actually add another NIC. So I'm going to add this one here and click add and we can see here it's named opt1. Now if I click on the name here then I come to the general configuration. I'm going to have to enable the interface and I'm going to change its name here to LAN2. And for the configuration type, I want it to be static IPv4. And now I need to give it an IP address. Now obviously it has to be on a different subnet to our other adapter. So I'm going to give it this IP, 192.168.2.1. With a mask of forward slash 24. And then I'm going to click on to save and apply changes. So now if I click back on services and DHCP server, we can see LAN1 and LAN2. And again we have the same options as before. So I'll assign the DHCP pool to this adapter, then save the configuration. But before we can use this second adapter, we're going to have to create some firewall rules for it. So let's click onto firewall and then go to rules. And you can see here we've got four different tabs, floating, WAN, LAN and LAN2. Now we're going to go into firewall rules in a future video, but just for now we're going to create a firewall rule for LAN2. So if we click onto LAN2, we can see there are no firewall rules for this interface. So let's click onto LAN1 here, and we've got this rule here, the default rule LAN to any, and this will allow traffic to flow on the interface. So what we're going to do, if we go to this icon here and click onto copy, we can duplicate the same firewall rule we then assign it to the other interface. And the action is pass, which will allow traffic through. And the interface, it's set for LAN. So we're just going to set it for LAN2. And we're also going to change the source here from LAN net to LAN2 net. And then description of the rule, I'm going to change this to default allow LAN2 to any rule. And then click save. And you can see that the rule's been added into the LAN2 section. And that's because although we edited the LAN1 rule, we changed the interface to LAN2. So now it's listed here. So now that we've created the allow LAN to any rule for this interface, anything we connect to it, we'll be able to get online. So that could be wired clients or wireless. So for this interface, let's try connecting a wireless access point to it. Now many of us may have an old ISP router lying around that we don't use anymore. 
So if we don't have a dedicated access point, then we can repurpose an ISP router instead and use that. So whether we use a dedicated access point or we repurpose something else, there's one setting on that that we have to make sure is not enabled, and that's DHCP. Because our PFSense box is our DHCP server, so we have to make sure that the access point isn't also trying to do the same job. So in this example, I'm going to repurpose an old ISP router and use that as an access point. So I'm going to configure it first before connecting it to PFSense. So I'm going to connect my laptop to the old router and then log into the web UI. And so for this router, and it's probably the same for most, we have to go to the advanced settings in order to disable DHCP. Then on this router now we have to click on basic and then there's the LAN settings. Kind of weird having to go to advanced and back to basic, but hey, that's how they made this one. And then in your LAN settings on whatever router you've got, you should hopefully see a checkbox where you can untick it and disable the DHCP server. And don't worry, by disabling the DHCP, you won't lose access to the web UI. And whilst we're in the LAN settings, we need to change the IP to be in the same subnet as what we set our interface earlier. So I'm going to change mine here to 192.168.2.254, which is outside of the IP pool, so that should be fine. Now for most routers, that's all you're going to have to do, just change the IP address and disable the DHCP. But there's always exceptions to the rule, and this route is one of them. So now I'm going to reboot this and connect it to the PFSense box. And I'm going to try to connect onto its Wi-Fi. And what should happen is it should be given the DHCP lease by the PFSense box. As you can see here, it's just not getting an IP and I'm not able to connect. So I'm going to assign a static IP in my laptop and then connect back to the web UI. And now this time I'm going to go to the WAN settings. And I'm going to go through and delete all the WAN connections that I can see here. Then I'm going to set up a new connection now and bind all of the available ports here and then change the connection type to bridge and then the important bit here I'm going to enable DHCP transparent transmission and enable VLAN then give it an ID and then click apply. So now I'm going to remove the static IP address from the network adapter on the laptop and now hopefully I'll be able to get an IP address now from the PFSense box. And now we can see we've been given an IP address from PFSense, which means we should now be able to get internet. OK, cool, so that's working. Now it doesn't matter which interface that we add an access point to, and we can add access points to multiple interfaces. Maybe one access point for the mainland, giving a private network, and then another on a separate interface for guest Wi-Fi or maybe Internet of Things. And we can do the same with only one interface and one access point if we have an access point that supports multiple SSIDs and also a VLAN capable switch. And we'll be taking a look at VLANs in a future PFSense video. Wow, so this video is almost 15 minutes long already. So I think it's time to stop here. But in the next video, we'll go through DNS on PFSense and setting that up. And also for those of you out there who are confused between DNS forwarding and DNS resolving, we'll take a look at that too. Now, if you can't wait for the next PFSense video and you're one of my Patreon supporters, new videos will be posted there a few days early before hitting YouTube. I just want to say to all of my supporters a massive thank you. Really, without you guys, I couldn't do this. Well, it's time for me to sign off and I hope you enjoyed this video enough to hit the like button and I hope you like the channel enough to subscribe. Anyway guys, whatever you're up to for the rest of the day, I hope it's good. I'll catch you next time.